Lost in a London Fog by Louisa May Alcott We've been to tea with some friends in Shaftesbury Terrace. We were so busy with our gossip that the evening slipped away, unperceived, till the clock struck half past ten. We were two lone ladies and had meant to leave early, as we were strangers in London and had some way to drive, so our dismay on discovering the lateness of the hour may be imagined. We had not engaged a carriage to come for us, knowing that a cab stand was nearby, but that cab would be much cheaper than the snug Broadham's ladies usually secure for evening use. Out flew the little maid to get us a cab, and we hurried on our wraps, eager to be gone. But we waited and waited for Mary, and did not come. We were beginning to think something had happened to her when she came hurrying back to say that all the cabs were gone from the neighboring stand and she had run to another where after some delay she had secured a hansom. Now it is not considered quite the thing for ladies to go about in handsome cabs without a gentleman to accompany them, especially in the evening. But being independent Americans and impatient to relieve our weary hostess of our presence, we said nothing, but bundled in, gave the address, 24 Colville Gardens, Bayswater, and away we went. A dense fog had come in, and nothing was visible but a short bit of muddy street, and lamps looming dimly through the midst. Our driver was a husky, as husky as it had got in his throat and the big white horse looked absolutely ghostly as he went off at a breakneck speed, breakneck pace which seems as natural to the London cab horse as mud is to the London streets. Isn't it fun to go rattling round and all out of doors style through a real London fog, said my sister, who was now enjoying her first visit to the surprising city. That remains to be seen for my part. I'd give a good deal to be shut up. Dry and descent. In a four-wheeler, this is so very rowdy. I returned, feeling much secret anxiety. As to the prop propriety of our proceeding, you are sure you gave the man the right direction, I asked, after we had driven through what seemed a wilderness of crescents, terraces, gardens, and squares. Of course I did. And he answered, all right, Mum. Shall I ask him if it's all right? Said Em. He would dearly like to poke up the little door in the roof, which was our only means of communication with the burly breezy shrub who sat up aloft to endanger the life of his fare. You may, for we have ridden long enough to go to St. Paul's. We went the little door, and Em asked blandly, are you sure you're going right, driver? No, Mum, I ain't. The cheering response breathed through the trap door, as Em called it in a hoarse whisper. I told you where to go, and it's time we were there. I'm new to come to London, Mum. And ain't used to these square parts and used to these parts yet, began the man. Good gracious, so are we. And I'm sure I can't tell you anything more than the name and number I have already given. You better ask the first policeman we meet, cried I, with a foreboding fear heavier than before. All right, Mum. And down went the little door and off rattled the cab. My irrepressible sister burst out laughing at the absurdity of our position. Don't laugh, Em. For mercy's sake, it's no joke to be wandering about this great city at eleven o'clock at night in thick fog. With a tipsy driver, I croaked with a warning pinch. He isn't tipsy, only stupid. And we are not to have engaged a carriage to come for us. He is tipsy, I smell gin in his breath, and he is half asleep up there, I have no doubt, for we have passed one, if not two policemen, I'm sure. Nonsense, you wouldn't know your own father in the midst. Let Jarvie alone, and he will bring us safely home. We shall see, I answer grimly, as a splash of mud lit upon my nose and the cab gave us a perilous lurch in cutting round a sharp corner. Did anyone ever find a policeman when he w was wanted? I never did. 
though they are as thick as blackberries when they are not needed. On and on we went, but not a felt helmet appeared, and never did escaping fugitive look more eagerly for the North Star than I did for a gleaming badge on a blue coat. There's a station I shall stop and ask, for I'm not going slamming and splashing about any longer. Hi there, driver. I poked up the door with a vigor and would have startled the soundest sleeper. A A mum, came the wheezy whisper, more wheezy than ever. Stop at this station house and hail someone. We must get home, and you must ask the way. All right, mum, come back to the hollow mockery conveyed in those exasperating words. We did stop, and a star did appear. When I, and all the dignity I could muster, stated the case, I asked for aid. Please, man X, gave it civility, but I greatly fear he did not believe that the muddy-faced woman and the croaky voice and the blonde damsel with curls, long earrings, and light gloves were really respectable members of the glorious American Republic. I felt this, and I could not blame him. So thanking him with a bow, which would have done credit to the noblest of my Hancock and Quincy ancestors, we went on again. Alas, alas, it was all go on and no stop. For although our driver had responded briskly, I, I, sir, to the policeman's inquiry, you know your way now, don't you? He evidently did not know it, and the white horse steadily went steadily up and down the long wet streets like a phantom steed in a horror dream. Things really were becoming serious. Midnight was approaching. I had not the remotest idea where we were, and the passers-by became more and more infrequent. Lights vanished from windows. Few cabs were seen, and the world was evidently going to bed. The fog was rapidly extinguishing my voice, and anxiety quenching my courage. M's curls hung limp and wild about her face, and even M's spirits began to fail. I am afraid we are lost, she whispered in my ear. Not a doubt of it. The man must be tipsy after all. That is evident. What will people think of us? What well, that we are tipsy also. That shall what shall we do? Nothing but sit here and drift about till morning. The man has probably tumbled off. This dreadful horse is evidently wound up and won't stop till he has run down. The fog is increasing, and nothing will bring us to a halt but a collision with some other shipwreck Yankee, as lost and miserable as we are. Oh, L, don't be sarcastic and grim now. Do exert yourself and land somewhere. Go to hotel. This horrid man must know where the Langham is. I doubt if he knows anything, and I am sure that eminently respectable house would refuse to admit such a pair of frights as we are at this disreputable hour. No, we must go till something happens to save us. We have discovered the secret of perpetual motion, and that is some comfort. M groaned, and I laughed. The ghostly horse sneezed, and I think the, dri the driver snored. When things are pretty comfortable, I am apt to croak. But when everything is tottering on the verge of annihilation, I usually feel rather jolly, such being the perversity of my fallen nature. I began to enjoy myself at this period. I nearly drove 4M out of her wits by awfully or whimsically suggestions and pictures so far, probable fate. It was so absurd that I really could not help seeing the funny side of the predicament, and M was the best fun of all. She looked so very... So like a dilapidated Ophelia with her damp locks, a blue rigolette, all awry, all awry, her white gloves tragically clasped, her pale countenance bespattered with the mud that lay thick on the wooden boot and flew freely from the wheels. I had my laugh out and then tried to mend matters. What could we do? My first impulse was to stir up the sleeping wretch above. And this I did by energetically twitching the reins that hung loosely before our noses, like the useless rudder of this lost ship. Oh, man, if you don't wake up and take us to Colville Gardens as quickly as possible, I shall report you tomorrow. I've got your number, and I shall get my friend, Mr. Peter Taylor, of Aubrey House, to attend to the matter. He's an MP, 
and will see that you are fined for attempting to drive a cab when you know nothing of London. I fear that most of this impressive harangue was lost, owing to the noise of the wheels and the feebleness of my nearly extinguished voice, but it is some effect, for though the man did not seem scared by the threatened wrath of an MP, he did feel his weak point and try to excuse it, for he answered in a gruffly apologetic tone, Who's a going to know anything in this blessed fog as this? Most cabbies wouldn't drive at no price, but I'll do my best, Mum. Very well. Do you know where you are now? I demanded. Blessed if I do. He didn't say blessed, quite the reverse, but I forgave him, for he really did seem to be making an effort, having had his nap out. An impressive pause followed, then M had an inspiration. Look, there's a respectable man who's going into his house from that four-wheeled cab. Let us hail the whole concern and get help of some sort. I gave the order, and eager to be rid of us at any price, our man rattled us up to the door, at which a gray-haired gentleman was settling with his driver, bent on clutching the spar of salvation. I burst out of our cab with, and hastened up to the astonished pair. What I said, I don't, don't know, but vaguely remember jumbling into my appeal all the names of all the celebrating and respectable persons whom I knew on both sides of the water, for I felt that my appearance was entirely against me, and really expected to be told to go about my business. John Bull, John Bull however, had pity on, upon me, and did his best for us, like a man and, his, and a brother. Take this cab, madam. The driver knows that he is about what he is about, and he will see you safely home. I'll attend to the other fellow, said the worthy man, politely ignoring my muddy visage and agitated manners. Murmuring blessings on his head, we skipped into the respectable four-wheeler. In a burst of confidence, I offered Mr. Bull my purse to defray the experience of our long drive. Rash woman, you'll never see your money again, cried M, hiding her Roman earring and clutching her extrusion locket, prepared for highway robbery, if not murder. I did see my purse again and my money, also, for that dear old gentleman paid our misery cabby out of his own pocket as I found afterwards and with a final gruff all right the pale horse and his bleary driver vanished in the mist it is and always will be my firm belief that it was a phantom cab that is still revolving ceaselessly around London streets appearing and disappearing through the fog to be hailed now and then by some faded passenger who is whisked to and fro bewildered and forlorn till rescued, when ghostly steed and phantom cab vanished darkly. Now you will be quite safe, ladies, and the good old gentleman dismissed us with a paternal smile. With a feeling of relief, I fell back, exhausted by our tribulations. I know now how the wandering Jew felt, said M, after a period of repose. I don't wish to quote, dear, but if the man does not stop soon, I shall begin to think we have gently stepped out of the frying pan into the fire unless we were several miles out of our way. We fought to arrive somewhere, I responded, flattening my nose against the pane, though I literally could not see one inch before the classical feature. Well, I'm so tired, I shall go to sleep. Whatever happens, you can wake me when it is time to scream or run, said M, setting herself for a doze. I groaned dismally, and registered a vow to spend all my substance in future on the most elegant and respectable brooms, procurable for money, with a gray-haired driver pledged to temperance, and a stalwart footman, armed with a lantern, pistol, directory, and a map of London. All of a sudden the cab stopped. The driver, not being a fixture, descended and, coming to the window, said civilly, The fog is so thick, Mum. I'm not quite sure if I'm right, but this is Colville Square. Don't know any such place. Colville Gardens is what we want. There's a church at the end, the trees in the middle, and no use, Mum, describing it. I can't see a thing, but the gardens can't be far off, so I'll try again. We never shall find it. So we had better ask the man to take us at once to some station, workhouse, or refuge till morning. Marked M, in such a tone, 
sleepy resignation that I shook her on the spot. Another jaunt up and down, fog getting thicker. Night later, one woman sleepier and other crosser every minute, but still no haven, haven hove in sight. Presently, the cab stopped with a decided bump against the curbstone, and the driver reappeared, saying with respectful firmness, My horse is beat out, and it's past my time for turning in. So if this ain't the place, I shall have to give it up, Mum. It's not the place, I answered, getting out the calmness of despair. There's a light in that house, and a woman looking out. Go and ask her where we are, suggested M, waking from her doze. Ready now for any desperate measure, I rushed up the steps, tried vainly to read the number, but could not, and rang the bell with f firm determination to stay in that house till morning at any cost. Steps came running down, the door flew open, and I was electrified at beholding the countenance of my own booksome landlady. My dear soul, where have you been? She cried as I stood staring at her, dumb with surprise and relief. From the Crystal Palace to Greenwich, I believe. Come in, M, and ask the man what the fair is. I answered, dropping into a hall chair and feeling as I imagine Robinson Crusoe did when he got home. Of course, that civil cabbie cheated me abominably. I knew it at the time, but never protested. I was so glad and grateful at landing safely, I should have paid a pound if he had asked it. Next day, we were heroines, and at breakfast alternately, thrilled and convulsed the other boarders by a recital of our adventures. But the strong-minded Americans got so well laughed at that they took great care never to ride in a handsome cabs again or get lost in the fog. And that's the end of Lost in a London Fog by Louisa May Alcott. I thought it was a good story. You know, it's one of those generic travel stories that these mid-19th century authors usually go on about. Um, I've heard stuff like this before. It's, it's not... It's one of Alcott's shorter stories, so... Um, I try to read her shorter stories because I don't have the attention span to read her longer story. I actually, I actually understood what was going on. Because I guess my brain's working better today, so. But I thought it was a good story. It's, it's just about getting lost and confused about where you are and not sure if you have a right guide to get you there, get you where you're going. But that's what life is, isn't it? It's pretty easy to get lost sometimes. Um, let me know in the comments below what did you think of the story. Please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community. And please like this video. It really helps the channel out a lot. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye.